So next question, we're moving on now to elbow stiffness and contracture. So we'll start off with a question on, on splint management. Static progressive turnbuckle splinting is the most appropriate for which of the following patients? And this is uh, number one, the answer three months after ORIF of the distal humerus with a flexion extension arc of 40 to 100 degrees with no further improvement. So typically we do splint management in patients who have plateaued in therapy three months after ORIF gives you enough time for this fracture to heal. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about stiffness. Uh, there, this is a pretty broad spectrum of, of problems and, and it's important to understand um, the treatments as it, as, it, as it relates to the underlying problems. So stiffness and contracture, the elbow result in loss of motion and functional limitations in these patients. Common causes uh, are osteoarthritis, trauma, uh, stiffness after elbow trauma, whether you treat this surgically or not is a pretty common problem and for whatever reason whenever we operate on the elbow stiffness is certainly an issue and then there are certain uh, congenital issues uh, and certain traumatic issues, traumatic brain injury, burns uh, are, 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 are all risk factors for stiffness. This is, these next two slides are very important slides. They talk about stiffness is, is kind of categorized as intrinsic and extrinsic stiffness. So intrinsic stiffness are issues related to the joint or the joint space. Uh, most importantly, joint incongruity, synovitis, loose bodies, fractures, malunions, post-traumatic arthritis. And the reason this is important is that intrinsic contractures are less responsive to splint management and therapy than some of the extrinsic causes. Uh, and extrinsic causes, uh, things like burn eschars, ectopic bone, con capsular contracture, ligamentous contracture, and you talked about the posterior portion of the medial ulnar collateral ligament with Buddy before. This is now a very commonly recognized limiter to elbow flexion. Uh, and also, as he described in the anatomy portion, the ulnar nerve uh, lies right over uh, the posterior uh, uh, bundle of the uh, ulnar collateral ligament uh, and, and plays a role or is involved in uh, contractures and the symptoms of them. And like anything, if you have a classification, mixed contractures, both intrinsic and extrinsic, are very common. So in the top left, you'll see uh, somebody who had uh, fracture, uh, fixation and radial head replacement for complex instability has developed heterotopic ossification up here, oops, sorry, in the anterior soft tissue. So this is extracapsular uh, heterotopic ossification. And then again, looking at the anatomy, uh, this is number two is the posterior bundle of the um, ulnar collateral ligament. Uh, Buddy talked about this, but normal functional range of motion is from 20 to 130 degrees, so it's a 100 degree flexion extension arc. And as Buddy said, now that we do many activities more away from the body, things like uh, computer work, um, uh, this functional arc of motion may extend to 20, 20 degrees of extension uh, as opposed to 30. And then a 50 degree uh, pronation supination arc, 100 degrees pronation, pronation supination, 50 degrees in each direction. So symptoms, these patients, depending on their underlying cause, will, will present with pain. Uh, um, and the reason they're coming to you is because they're stiff and contracted. So by definition, they're going to have decreased range of motion. And usually, one of the things you need to determine is whether this diminished range of motion affects their activities of daily living, either occupational or recreational activities of daily living. You want to look at their skin to see if they have any scars from burns or previous surgery. You want to look at not only the absolute range of motion of their elbow, but the character of that range, meaning do they have a soft endpoint or a rigid endpoint. Uh, if they have less than 90 to 100 degrees, so that seems to be the magic number where the ulnar nerve and the posterior band of the ulnar collateral ligament uh, need to be considered. And then obviously a, a very detailed neurologic assessment. And I will tell you ulnar nerve dysfunction in this group of patients may not be apparent in the form of motor or sensory changes at the hand. Very often as you try to force flexion in these folks who have a contracted posterior band of the ulnar collateral ligament, they'll point to pain at the medial aspect of the elbow. So they'll point to the uh, cubital tunnel and say it hurts there. And that can be as much contracted soft tissue as it is 
traction or uh, compression of the ulnar nerve at the cubital tunnel. Radiographs are important to give us some sense for what we're dealing with. So these are two examples of ectopic bone. Uh, the top uh, right, it, this is a patient who had an arthroscopic debridement of his elbow for osteoarthritis and developed post-operative heterotopic ossification in the posterior compartment. And this is a patient post-trauma who developed a large amount of heterotopic ossification anteriorly. And we'll talk about how do you know when to resect it and all that stuff in a bit. Now, this is a patient with primary osteoarthritis of the elbow, so very classic signs. Osteoph osteophytes here posteriorly, osteophytes in the supracondylar region anteriorly, osteophytes at the tip of the coronoid, tip of the olecranon, and this is a red herring down here. This is a traction spur at the triceps attachment, which is not involved uh, in the underlying process of osteoarthritis. And then the post-trauma patients, we want to carefully look here for ectopic bone. We want to make sure their fractures are healed and that there's no issues with the hardware. CAT scan, so advanced imaging is particularly important in planning uh, surgery on these patients. Very often loose bodies in the joint are underrepresented on plain radiographs. Um, in the osteoarthritic population, you have to recognize that this is a three-dimensional process. And if you're going to be dealing with these either open or arthroscopically, that you need to recontour the anatomy three-dimensionally. And so you'll see this ring of osteophytes around the tip of the olecranon. You have an osteophyte up here on the medial, excuse me, lateral side of the olecranon fossa in the trochlear articular surface, a medial osteophyte and then what we call ridge osteophytes along the medial wall. Uh, and your ulnar nerve sits right in this region. So you can imagine that osteophytes growing from inside out, pressing against an ulnar nerve, which is bound by the ligament, uh, the soft tissue constraints of the cubital tunnel can lead to ulnar nerve symptoms. So next question, 52-year-old man sustained a left elbow injury shown in figure A while playing basketball two and a half months ago. He underwent the, sh uh, the procedure shown in B. Uh, Postoperatively, he was immobilized in a hinged brace. On exam today, two and a half months later, he had an arc of flexion from 70, uh, his arc of flexion is 75 degrees with 45 degrees loss of full extension. His dash score is 45 points, so he's disabled. What initial treatment option will likely provide the greatest improvement in the patient with this DASH score? And so here are our radiographs. This is a displaced, incarcerated uh, medial epicondyle uh, fragment that is fixed. And the answer to this question is supervised therapy with static progressive splinting. Okay, so again, this is somebody who is re has trauma. He's healed from that trauma, has a soft tissue contracture. Uh, and static progressive splinting uh, and supervised therapy uh, can benefit this patient. The others uh, in and of themselves are not adequate. We'll talk a little bit about non-operative treatment. Non-operative treatments are anti-inflammatories, uh, active and passive uh, ranges of motion and therapy. These are first-line treatments in most cases for subtle contractures. If these contractures are more profound uh, and less responsive than static splinting, we're getting away from dynamic splinting, moving towards static splinting. You get what's called um, stress relaxation of the tissues, and it's much better tolerated by patients than dynamic splinting, which is um, uh, just c consistent force applied uh, to a contracted joint. The, that tends to be much more painful. And this is an article. Uh, this is from uh, David Ring and Jesse Jupiter's group looking at uh, dynamic versus static present progressive splinting uh, in um, uh, contracted elbows, uh, uh, demonstrating no um, difference uh, in the two uh, patients. And I will just tell you from personal experience, static splinting is much better uh, uh, tolerated by patients. So next question on stiffness. 49-year-old man sustains a dislocation of his left elbow that is successfully reduced and splinted. He misses his scheduled follow-up appointment and returns six weeks later. He's immediately enrolled in a course of vigorous therapy at a re repeat visit six months at six months. So it's a fairly non-compliant patient exam reveals 
lack, he lacks 40 degrees of elbow extension and has flexion to, to 80 degrees, so this is a fairly high degree contracture. He's taken to the operating room for release. Uh, figures A and B are diagrams depicting the ligamentous attachments to restore elbow flexion in addition to releasing the capsule which ligament should be released. This has been drilled fairly repeatedly here and so this is lateral a lateral elbow on the right, medial elbow on the left and the answer to this question as we've talked about repeatedly uh, is ligament B, the posterior band of the ulnar collateral ligament. So let's talk a little bit about the indications for capsule release and ca as far as I'm concerned the posterior band of the collateral ligament is a portion of the joint capsule. So the indications are extrinsic capsular contractures. Uh, again we talked a little bit about uh, you need a normal joint service. You need to have a congruent joint in order for a soft tissue contracture in and of itself to work. Uh, patients with arthritis less uh, are le less predictably improve with an isolated soft tissue contracture. It doesn't mean that you don't do it, it just means their results are less reliable. Let's talk about heterotopic ossification. So in folks who have heterotopic bone, you saw this uh, uh, x-ray on the top right previously and really nowadays we're, we're resecting HO once the HO is mature. So when it's well demarcated when it's trabeculated, meaning it looks like mature bone, that's the time to do it. And most of us think that within two to three months after the, the presentation of HO that it's mature enough to remove, but that's a radiographic determination. Now the bottom left is a uh, bone scan of somebody with heterotopic ossification. And when I trained with Bernie Mori, he said, if you never want to operate on somebody with heterotopic bone, wait for the bone scan to become cold to do it. It never happens. Uh, arthroscopic releases, these are very technically demanding sur uh, surgeries and really you need advanced arthroscopic skills to do this. Um, you, um, the radial nerve is most at risk anteriorly and so you can see um, this is uh, the front of the joint so coronoid is here, radial head is, excuse me, radial head here, coronoid over here. This is the capsule has been excised, brachialis is over here. Um, uh, brachioradialis is here in this little white line in the interval between those is the radial nerve. So radial nerve is at risk and we certainly know that posteriorly the ulnar nerve lives posteriorly here uh, right at medial epicondyle, medial trochlea, medial ulna and it's right there under that capsule, the posterior uh, band of the uh, ulnar collateral ligament. There are a couple of ways you can get at these uh, contractures uh, and it depends primarily on what their presenting symptoms are. The lateral column approach, this was described by Bernie Mori, which is here on the top right. Uh, this is the lateral supracondylar region. This is the capitellum over here. The interval anteriorly is between extensor carpi radialis longus extending down into a common extensor split and if you as soon as you start to elevate the ECRL, you get right down on joint capsule. You can separate the muscle from the capsule all the way across medially and then very easily swing posteriorly uh, through Coker's interval, Ancaneus here, triceps get swept posteriorly to the back of the elbow. Uh, a medial over the top approach, this was described by Hotchkiss. Uh, I use this approach as a primary uh, approach uh, when I'm going to be dealing with the ulnar nerve or when they have limited flexion and I'm going to need to deal with the posterior band of the ulnar collateral ligament. So this is shoulders up top, hand is down here to the bottom left. This is your ulnar nerve here, medial epicondyle, and you take the upper two-thirds uh, of the flexor pronator, you leave the lower third to protect the anterior band of the ulnar collateral lig anterobundle ulnar collateral ligament. And as you elevate this muscle in a continuous sheet, you come right down onto the anterior capsule. And then if you're going to move the nerve, you flip it forward and then swing to the back to deal with things in the back. And the only thing you really can't get from the medial side is anything way posterior, like an osteophyte on the back side of the capitellum. Uh, very often you need to do combined approaches, medial and lateral, so you'll start on one side and if you get everything you need from one side, that's the end of it. If you need more, then you got to go to the other side. So which of the following statements is true regarding the posterior oblique portion of the medial collateral ligament of the elbow? 
And the answer is it can be released to gain uh, flexion in patients with post-traumatic contracture. And we've talked, looked at the, looked at this before and talked about this at length. Moving on, for the, now that we're talking about el elbow stiffness, so we're talking about distraction interposition arthroplasty as a treatment for stiffness. Um, and, and this is folks with intrinsic contracture, so the, where the joint surface itself is affected. This is used in patients with significant arthritis, and the number that most people use, if more than 50% of the articular surface is involved, then you need to do something more than just a simple soft tissue release. So this is what we do in their significant cartilage destruction in higher demand patients. Uh, this is some, typically done as a um, replace or a resurfacing of the distal humerus. So this, in this case, this is the aponeurotic portion of the Achilles tendon. You can also resurface the ulna as well. Uh, and this is the use of a dermal allograft. So this is a malunited patient, a much more complex problem than if the anatomy of the distal humerus is fairly well maintained. Nowadays, I don't skeletonize the humerus like this. You tend to try to leave whatever collateral ligaments are intact. Typically, I try to hinge these on an intact ulnar collateral ligament and work from the outside. Uh, instability is the most common problem here, uh, and so the less you can do to disrupt the soft tissues, the better. We'll move on to elbow arthroplasty. Again, this is primarily for an articular-based problem, so intrinsic contracture. And this is in a lower demand patient population. We'll talk about the results of elbow replacement in low demand rheumatoid patients versus higher demand post-traumatic patients. Uh, the problem with elbow arthro arthroplasty in younger patients is that it has a very high failure rate at a much shorter time frame. And most young patients, even many older patients, are unwilling to, to abide by the lifting restrictions that we place on these patients. Uh, complications of management of the stiff elbow, post-operative post HO, I showed you an example of that in my practice. Uh, you can treat this prophylactically. Most people are getting away from low-dose radiation as a prophylaxis against HO. And most, most of us, if we use anything, we'll use indocin. Many, many patients use nothing. Now, ulnar nerve-related issues are, are ever-present in stiffness operations, and then obviously recurrent stiffness uh, is a real issue, particularly the more involved the joint surface is at the time of your surgery. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.